Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for our last session of the day. My name is Curtis Rempel. I'm the Crop Production Innovation, um, Vice President for Crop Production Innovation at the Canola Council of Canada. Um, I've been doing this Curtis's Corner as a wrap up for our Canola Discovery Forum for a number of years now. And it's tended to be a bit of an eclectic, um, a bit of an eclectic adventure in answering discussions questions or looking at discovery. I think last year, if I remember correctly, we looked at uh, the, we had a series of presentations by researchers looking at the value of um, canola-based ALA on brain health and cognition and whether we could need, whether there was a need to supplement with the marine-based EPA and DHA because there are now marine-based uh, canola cultivars that will be potentially entering into the marketplace in the near future. So we had a, a good discussion on that, and, uh, and then I think we also looked at bioplastics, and some of you know canola protein makes a pretty good starting point for a biodegradable plastic, and uh, looked at uh, the value of canola protein for, for single-use plastics. As you know, the federal government is looking at a ban starting next year on the use of single-use plastics, and so how can we get bio-based solutions? And the, we had a good discussion on scale-up, but of course the challenge that we ended up talking about was when you, when you want to break down bio-based plastics, you use UV light. And that's stan the standard way you make them uh, susceptible to UV light. But now if you have a single-use ag application like, like mulch for um, horticulture or bale wrap, of course you want it to be resistant to UV light. So it presents a new challenge and a new a new area for discovery. Today, um, for our discovery forum, we're going to keep on with the theme that we've had a little bit for the course of the day, increasing profitability while managing risk. And we have two other speakers uh, that I'm going to introduce briefly, and then my colleague Marissa and myself will be looking at that, uh, that question and doing a bit of a dive into the brown soil zones, and we'll get to that, why that is the case in a few minutes. So the first presenter uh, this afternoon is Evan, Evan Schout from Maverick Ag. His, his presentation is going to be the 6% rule, how technology, humans, and agronomy have changed the 5% rule. And he was giving me a little bit of a warning that this will be a delve into social sciences as well as to hard agronomy, so I welcome that. Evan is the, is the president and co-founder of Maverick Ag, a business consulting and risk management firm based here in Western Canada. He also sits as the president, co-founder, and lead coach at Farmer Coach, an education and coaching program for primary producers both here in Canada and the United States. These organizations fall under the Hebert Group of Companies, which includes Hebert Grain Ventures, a 30,000 grain and oilseed operation in southeast Saskatchewan, where Evan sits as a chief financial officer. So that's the industry viewpoint. We have an academic viewpoint. Dr. Terrace Lychuk from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada is going to be joining us virtually this afternoon. Uh, his topic is precision farming and big data research in the context of crop production, environmental impact, and changing climate. Dr. Lychuk is a research scientist in precision agriculture and cropping systems at AFC's Brandis Research Center. His work is concentrated on project production zone management in the field, cropping systems with alternative crop and field management scenarios, VR fertilizer, landform analysis, terrain attributes, remote sensing and ground-based sensing, and field scale modeling coup coupled with big data and machine learning methods. So a, a a fitting close to the day. And then last but not least will be Marissa and myself, and I'll let Marissa introduce herself when she gets up here. So take it away, Evan. Clicker, guys? Can you hear me clearly? Check, check. We're good at the back? Perfect. Okay, as Curtis said, my presentation today, guys, I'm, I'm gonna go off the rails for you, okay? I'm gonna take you through the social sciences side of agriculture. I am gonna delve a little bit into the agronomy and some ROI stuff. But after listening to the, the presentation right before me in the panel, 
I, I found it interesting that the answers to some of the questions, such as why would producers go into precision AI, was growth mentality and curiosity, right? So the focus today is I've got data that would go against that. That's how I know that there's a lot more industry on this call than there is producers. So technology, humans, and agronomy, how they change this, the 5% rule. How many people in the crowd are entrepreneurs? Hands up. Perfect. I asked that question in Montana last week, speaking at the Grain Growers Conference, and not one of the 400 producers in the room stuck their hand up. Not one. So if you want a, a lesson on social sciences, there it is. None of our extremely profitable and very good producers actually believe that they're business owners. They know they run a farm and they're really good at growing grain. They haven't got that next concept of we're running a business. Okay. Do I have a clicker guys? That might work. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. So Bill Gates quote to start you off. One of our good entrepreneurs. Most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10. So the reason I have this one up here is this one identically leads to the conversation of Twitter, which they had about an hour ago. About a month ago on Twitter, guy asked a simple question. How do these guys seed 24 hours a day? And me being dumber than I look, decided I would give an answer. Well, we do this and this. And for the next hour and a half, I had 150 replies of why it couldn't be done. Too wet, too dark, safety hazard, every excuse you could have from any person, right? This is the social sciences side. If we'd have asked the question, let's say you've been seeding 24 hours for 10 years, look back and tell me how you did it, then we get somewhere. Shifts, hired extra people, batch fill on the sprayer, timed our fills. That's where we need agriculture to keep moving, okay? So change is constant, dream big and innovate fast. We purchased a spray trailer last year, 100 and, 100 and some thousand dollar spray trailer, biggest, fanciest, newest thing on the line. Went down there two days later to see the farm and this thing was in pieces sitting in the shop. What are we doing? Well, the two mechanics said wasn't good enough. Needed some updates. So this is the most brand new technology out. This is the Cadillac. Not for our farm, it's not. This is where we gotta get. So I said I had data against it. We are fighting a losing battle. Curtis and I were sitting here at the front and we were talking about what's the holdup and what's pulling guys back. It's that the people in this room are doing very good at creating things, producers are the bottleneck. It took us 11 years just to get 50% of the industry to adopt GPS technology. Auto steer, 11 years. Soil sampling, the industry's still not doing it. We're still not at 50% uptake on soil sampling. Sectional variable rate, get into some of the actual precision egg tools. Yield mapping has been out since 1994 and we're still not at 50%. This is the social sciences side of how do we get the producers to believe in the products and do the uptake. Oh, wrong way. Okay, so as the title of my thing said, we're going to talk about the 5% rule today. Show of hands, anybody heard this presentation before? Good, very few. So, where the story begins. If you're gonna take something from me talking today, write down that name, Dr. Danny Kleinfelter. He is one of the top 25 most influential minds in agriculture. He created the TPAP program, which is the executive program for producers down at Texas A&M. And he's also sits on our advisory board. So 
So his biggest accomplishment was through data analysis, they realized that the difference between the top 25 producers and the top bottom 75% of producers in the industry was only a 5% difference. So in this room, we're talking about precision. We're talking about the next big thing. We're talking about light years, right? We only got to be 5% better. We just got to take the first step. So my thought process goes that the biggest innovation in agriculture is going to be between the ears. It's not a technology. It's not a crop. It's not a plant. It's a mindset. So, as I said, top 25% of farms are about 5% better than the average. Anybody in here play sports? We're going to put it in sports words for you. The difference between a 300 hitter and a 250 hitter is only one extra hit every 20 at bats. So why does that matter? So, this is my canola example for you. And don't worry, I normalize the price because I don't want to show you where the number is using today's prices. So 40 bushel at 12 bucks an acre, 480 bucks revenue. The average farm has about 210 of inputs on canola, 220 fixed costs, 50 bucks an acre. Our 10 year average on farms across Western Canada is about 10 bucks an acre, or sorry, 50 bucks an acre. So let's say we do a 5% cut on our cost of production, just 5%. That 50 goes to 72 bucks an acre. Let's say we do a 5% increase on yield. That's two bushels per acre. That's 74 bucks an acre. Let's say we do a 5% increase on price. 60 cents more per bushel, 74 bucks an acre. Let's say we get adventurous, do 5% on yield and price. 99. And lastly, the holy grail. Yield price and costs. If we are 5% better in those three areas, the difference is 121 bucks an acre versus 50. Over five years, that's 2,073,000. Over 10 years, that's 5.1 million. The laws of compounding. We only have to be 5% better and we need to get the producers to believe they only need to be 5% better. So how do we do it? The most dangerous phrase in agriculture is we've always done it this way. Wayne, sorry guys. Wayne Gretzky was not the best because he went to where the puck was. He was the best because he went to where the puck was going to be. So you want the ROI part of portion of this? Here it is. Gross margin, working capital, why is it important? Well, we've seen the highest fertilizer prices we've ever seen this year, and we've seen the highest commodity markets, including canola, we've seen this year. If you bought at the low and sold at the high because you didn't need cash flow, you'd be 186% better than you'd be if you did the alternative. Accrual versus cash. This one in Canada, we're getting better at but there is still a very large portion of our producers that are using cash accounting. And down in Montana, a very large portion were using cash accounting. So accrual accounting essentially tells us if we made money. So we're asking producers to adopt the next best technologies. Some of them don't even know if we made money last year. Managing margins and logistics. A lot of our producers went out and bought fertilizer in June at the lowest price it was. Not a lot of them actually booked crop for next year at the same time. So we're really good at doing one side of the coin, really bad at doing both sides. The four R's, right place, right source, right time, right rate. So if we want to talk sustainability, this is your emissions targets. The four R's is what every crop show I've been to in the last six months, essentially shooting towards. Nobody knows how to do it. We can talk variable rate, we can talk sectional control. We use moisture probes across our farm. There's a million technologies out there, but based on the slide I showed you, nobody's using them. Farm trials. So we are what we call the Area 51 for John Deere. Christian was doing, a, my business partner was doing a presentation down in the US and a couple of his slides were pretty harsh on John Deere and 
The guy comes up to him at the end and he says, how come you're so hard on us? He says, well, make a better product and make it affordable. The person happened to be the CEO of John Deere. So he says, you're so smart, how do we do it? He said, well, let me try all your equipment. He kind of laughed. 10 years later, we prototype equipment for John Deere up here and we do all of their data analysis because we keep really strong data. So the last presentation, they were talking about keeping data and that's how we were gonna get the sustainability and government and everything on our side. We need to get to that point with all producers. Marketing, Dr. Cole out of the US, his essentially was, don't try to hit the highs. If you hit the highs, you're never gonna do it. You wanna market to a profit. And lastly, risk management. So whenever I talk about risk management, everybody always assumes insurance, right? Subsidies, government programs. No, risk management is, what's your cost of production? How many humans do you have on the farm? How's the weather? There's a million different risks on a farm. We need to associate them all. So back to your example of 186%. So canola, if we'd have sold at the high price last year, it was 25 bucks an acre. Maybe just for a day, but it was there. The low was more close to 18. Inputs, if you'd have bought in June, it was about 150. If you bought in December, it was about 250. On margin alone, those two sides of the coin on working capital would have got you 81%. Now, if we go back to the 5% rule and say, let's cut our cost by 5% as well, the difference is 186%. That's 630 bucks an acre compared to 220. Small changes, big effects. Okay, so here's where we really get into the ROI side. So, human resources. We have about seven full-time guys on our farm and about eight part-time. So we always have a debrief after harvest. And one of our, used to work on the oil rigs, comes in and he says, you know what? My biggest problem is I go into town and I go drinking with my buddies at the bar and they all call me a farm laborer. Farm laborer is now a dirty word. So in terms of HR, we are in an economy where HR is getting very tight and we are in an industry where it is seen as a detriment to be a farm laborer. How do we fix that? Cost management, what we measure, we manage. How many farms can tell you their cost of production today? If I ask the room, the answer is not usually very high. In fact, the TPAP stats say 60% of producers actually market without knowing their cost of production. So they're selling grain without actually knowing what it costs them to grow it. Working in versus on the business. So I go to a strategic coach program in Toronto. So does my business partner. We also have EOS on the farm, which is an operating system. As I said, we run it like a business. And he was on a plane ride with one of his members at Stratcoach. The guy owns Mexico vacation resorts. And they were talking about SOPs, which let's be serious on a farm, not a lot of farms have SOPs, but I'm guessing a lot of the companies in here have SOPs. So they were talking about rainy days. And on a farm, what happens on a rainy day? Hired help stay home, they sleep in, they probably catch up on their rest. What happens on a resort in Mexico? They wake up, they have a process. They start doing entertainment inside. They get the meal served inside. There is a checklist of things they do. Guess what? We now have a rainy day process on our farm. If it rains middle of harvest, you're at the shop at 8 a.m., we have a list of items to do. It's just an SOP. It's not anything huge and monumental. It's just a change in mindset. Equipment optimization. So. On the equipment side, when we start talking data, how many people do you actually think know how to pull the data out of their combines or their tractors or every other source of data we have on the farm, which is probably larger than most industries? Not many. We can actually extrapolate the stuff out of JD Link and I can tell you how many times our guys sitting in the combine hit the GPS button. So John Deere has this new, uh, and I apologize for using John Deere as an example, but that's what we run on the farm, so it's easier. They have a technology in their combines called Harvest Smart. 
it will drive the combine for you. Since I'm in a technology filled room, goes the speed that is optimal based on the sensors, based on grain loss, based on capacity, based on horsepower, based on bushels thrown out the back. It is about 20 to 25% better than the human component based on our trials. In 2019, our guys missed 1,800 acres because they didn't hit the button. That was the 20% they lost. In 2019, we left 1,500 acres of barley sitting in the field because we had three feet of snow in September. You think we want that, those acres back? Yes. The data tells us we could have had them. The other one with equipment optimization, if we're talking ROI, the example on the right, back to my 24 hours of seeding. Why do we do it? One drill, four humans. So we have a shift. We run 13 hour shifts on the farm, one guy to drive the jail, drill each shift, and one guy to do logistics, hauling fertilizer, chemical, everything else. Equipment cost a million bucks, that's amortization of 150, so on, so on, debt, principal. The accrual expense of us doing that's about 227,000 bucks. The cash expense is about 260,000. Now, let's go to farm B. Runs two drills, three humans, doesn't go 24 hours. So, now the equipment cost is two million, because you need two drills. The labor cost is slightly less, but in the end, the accrual expense is 417,000. The cash cost is 482. That is a cash cost difference of 60 bucks compared to 32. And all we did was hire one more human. Small steps. Change is constant, the way we put it. If it's not broke, you just haven't looked hard enough. The moment you think you are doing everything right, somebody else is doing it better than you. Perfection versus logistics. So, as strategic coach, they talk about the gap and the gain. It's a little tool we call. I asked the farmers in Montana last year, or last week, sorry, how many acres did you believe you were gonna grow when you started? This older guy chokes up, he goes, my goal was 4,000 acres. I said, how many acres are you now? 20. I said, did you celebrate when you got your 4,000? He goes, I can't even remember the year we did it. All the gap in the gain is, is that we are constantly moving the goalpost. We are constantly getting bigger, more strategic goals. We never actually look back to see how far we've come. So perfection versus logistics. And lastly, rugged individualism. We are in an industry where farmers are very rugged individualistic. It means they like to succeed by themselves and they like to fail by themselves. Anybody ever heard of Coffee Row? It's the place where you go to find out the most untruthful information you can. Okay, so a few slides on HR because it is the number one risk on our farm right now between policy and HR. This is a slide out of Manitoba. If this doesn't scare the agriculture industry, I don't know what will. So my biggest fear is that you people in this room create some of the best technology we can have and we won't have the people to run it. Now, whenever I do this slide, I also get people saying, well, we're a 3,000 acre farm, dad and son, we don't care about HR. Not true. HR doesn't have to be external labor. HR is essentially the roles and responsibilities of everybody on the farm. So, farmer starts at the age of 20, retires at the age of 105. <laughs> Let's call it 55 just to be nice. Based on the time spent with children, what are the years that you should be spending time with your children? Between the ages of 20 and 55. So, why is HR important? Because as farmers, we're really good at finding more work. The other one, time spent with partner. If you wake up at 55 and you miss the whole first part of that graph, you're going to know the person you're retiring with. So everybody kind of asks, you've given us a lot of problems. What's the solution? I said, I'm not sure I've got a solution for HR. They said, well, what's the biggest problem? This is the biggest problem. Show of hands, who in the room is married? How's your communication with your wife? Not bad. 
Good little not bad. Okay, the second graph. Who's got a young child in the room? So let's say an eight day old, because the first seven days they sleep, they eat, they poop. They're actually quite pleasant. Let's call it the eighth day. You ever tried communicating with an eight day old? There's your communication complexity. You ever tried communicating with a brand new employee? Kind of the same effect. Now the last one. Let's throw in a two year old. So you got husband, wife, two year old, and an eight day old. How's the communication? Why are we so bad at HR? We are bad at HR because it is 500% complexity just by having four humans. So one of the last slides, land building finance. So farmers are really good at being farmers. What they haven't realized is they're also real estate owners and they're investors. How many farms do you know put every dollar they make back into the farm? Almost all of them. The problem is they still call themselves farmers. So there's your life cycle. Farmer starts out as an employee or a kid on the farm, goes into management, starts making decisions, buys some real estate, buys some land, puts all his money back into the farm. And if anybody knows when you turn 70 or 75 and your kids take over, you're back being an employee. That is the cycle of life on a farm. So the shift, equity to management. So we've gone through the times of very high land equity increase. What we're starting to see now is that before, those farms that had really good equity were your strong farms. Growth, everything else. Now what we found is that the management side of agriculture, once margins tightened, now management is actually starting to shine through. Your strongest farms are the ones that are managed the best. Interest rate risk, I wish I had an answer for you here. We could book 10 year money at 2% two years ago, and now it's seven and a half. So if that's not gonna affect land accumulation, I'm not sure what will. And then storage versus margin. I think we've realized that infrastructure is important when you see some of the fertilizer markets. So that would be the next step. So why is the succession and interest rate risk and everything else important? Because the average age of farms in this country is 55 years or older. I read a stat that 80% of the land in Western Canada will trade hands in the next decade, whether through succession, transition, or multi-generational. I also listened to a speaker down in Montana by the name of Damian Mason, comedian, really funny, but he did bring up some really good points, is that the media says we have to feed 9 billion people, right? We gotta get better, we gotta grow more grain. What if I told you we're at 8 billion and the actual population is decreasing? Average kids per family were 2.1 when the baby boomers were in, it's now 1.6. In certain countries, they're actually incentivizing people to have kids and it's not working. We actually waste 33% of the food that we produce every year. We're growing enough food, that's not the issue. The issue is that we're running out of people. Okay, so last slide and then I'll get off the stage because I'm sure I'm getting close to my 35. So the mindset, 6% and beyond. True competitive advantage. Brett Walsh was the one that said, if you can adapt and learn, that is your true competitive advantage. Strategic management, Warren Buffett said, only when the tide goes out do we see who is swimming naked. Analyzing, and I love this story, so it was in good to great, the book. Kimberly Clark, anybody know who Kimberly Clark is, the company? They make Kleenex. Do you wanna know what their number one revenue generator was before that? They were a paper mill. At the height of their revenue, the paper mill made 95% of the revenue, and their CEO decided to shut it down to start working on consumer goods. They shut down their biggest revenue generator to make Kleenex. Now, good idea? Yes. Learning organizations, continuous management improvement, whether it's through coaching, whether it's through education, 
Timing. Top 20% of farms versus the bottom 80 comes in terms of timing. Whether it's when you seed, working capital, when you take on opportunities. And then the last one. The future belongs to those that are ready to take the opportunity. And I throw this one into all my presentations now, guys, because obviously mental health and agriculture has become a very large topic. We need to remember that not everybody's judging us as much as we judge ourselves, just to keep that in mind. That's what I got, guys. Thank you. You bet. Hello? Okay, uh, can you can you see me now? Oh, I hear a great deal of feedback. Voices um, returning back to me. see you in front of your camera we probably need your presentation now okay uh... maximize it all right can you presentation we see you and we can hear you very okay uh, I I still hear the echo in my uh, in my um, earbuds. Testing. Well, I guess I'll just proceed like that. All right. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Taras Lichuk, um, and uh, I'm uh, talking to you today from uh, um, Cold Brandon. Uh, we were under minus 30 this morning, and uh, we warmed up to minus 16, and I hope it's warmer in Saskatoon than here in Brandon. Um, uh, so uh, I'm a research scientist here at the Brandon Research and Development Center. Um, and uh, the talk of uh, the the topic of my presentation today is uh, precision farming and big data research in the context of crop production, environmental impact, and climate change. And and what I'm trying to do here, um, I hope that uh, by the end of this uh, talk, you will um, you'll see like the holistic uh, picture of the um of our research program here in brandon where we combine uh, precision agriculture big data um uh, field scale modeling into um, into this comprehensive approach to um, um to assist producers with the regards to uh, crop production and nutrient management in the field using uh, whole bunch of tools that we have uh, in uh, in our pockets, so to say. So, uh, in in essence, what uh, the 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 goal of this research is to understand 
uh, the driving factors for uh, crop yield and nutrients in the field. And um, hello? Um, okay, so it's uh, the feedback disappeared. All right, this is much better. Um, uh, and you can still hear me, right? Okay, hearing no, uh, hearing none, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that you can still hear me. Um, so the goal here is to understand the, the driving factors uh, that, uh, that drive crop yield um, and uh, nutrient dynamics in the field, within the field. I would like to emphasize that this is a field scale research, uh, which is of a direct relevance to producers. And um, the second objective here is to develop predictive models, um, predictive methods um, based on um, analysis with uh, spatial models uh, to make a decision support system, which will allow producers to um, uh, assess holistically their, uh, the, the field management and crop management uh, details in their particular field. And uh, another uh, big pillar of this research is to assess, um, to overlay different uh, climate change scenarios to see uh, w whether the uh, certain um, field practices um, will be sustainable uh, moving forward in the future, uh, say 50, 60, 100 years from now, uh, uh, and as close as uh, maybe a couple of decades from now and to see what can be done in order to maintain these production systems in terms of uh, maintaining crop yield and um, hopefully reducing the environmental footprint. Uh, so there, there are certain uh, objectives um, that fall under these, the, the two main goals that I just discussed. Uh, the first one is to uh, the assessment of within field variability in terms of crop yield with respect to fertilizer management, um, uh, crop rotation and residue management. Um, the, the second important objective is to identify uh, field zones uh, where nitrogen and phosphorus accumulate in soils, again, on the field scale with different um, rotations of which canola is normally present. And then the third one uh, related to our modeling component research is the um, simulation of crop yield, nutrient transport, uh, emissions, um, so organic carbon dynamics um, under, under historical and climate change scenarios in, uh, in our research field using RPEX model um, and the details of the model I will discuss uh, in the following slides. So uh, I'm gonna give a few examples of the fields that we currently have uh, in our research program. And uh, they're mainly fields that are presently involved um, in the Living Labs research project uh, conducted by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And uh, they were also a uh, legacy field that we had in the past, in the past project funded by the Lake Winnipeg, uh, and also the uh, field that were uh, research on the variable rate, um, which was, uh, which were included in the Canola Council uh, of Canada funded project that were conducted by uh, Dr. Al Moon here in Brandon. Um, so I'll give a few details about uh, the, the the some aspects of uh, some aspects of what uh, of those fields. Uh, what was the experimental design and the, the fixed factors? Um, so uh, we've established um, the trials with replicated strips uh, of uh, fixed variable rates of fertilizer. You can see on the right side of the diagram the uh, the four different rates. Um, and uh, normally there were four replicates in each field uh, that included low average and high yielding zones. Um, we have that we've identified production zones. Um, uh, those are um, uh, consistently producing high, medium and low zones. Um, uh, they, we would establish them by analyzing historical yield um, as a function of um, also terrain attributes and soil properties. 
uh, with, a, with a goal to um, see where nitrogen and phosphorus tend to accumulate in the field scale. Now, um, the new approach to this research that I'm doing is that uh, in the two fields, we've established um, the real-time soil moisture probes. They're produced by uh, Stevens, um, Stevens Water, and they're combined, um, they're combined um, uh, EC, uh, moisture and temperature uh, probe. You can see the, the picture of the probe here. Um, we've, we've, uh, we've installed those uh, probes um, across the soil profile down to one meter uh, at, uh, I, uh, so they're at um, 15, 30, 50, 60 centimeters and 100 centimeters. And they provide um, 15 minute real time data, um, soil moisture data uh, for those particular um, fields. Again, those are installed in each, uh, in uh, low, medium and high producing zones. Um, and the idea there is to um, account for the effects of soil moisture in a big data analysis to see um, how big uh, how big of a variation this um, this component, the soil moisture, explains uh, in uh, in crop yield and and nutrient dynamics. Now, in addition to um, in addition to the the, the soil moisture probes. Uh, we're looking at um, several um, um, several uh, remote sensing uh, products, either ground-based or uh, or remote sensely based. Uh, for example, we're also using the data from a radar side constellation mission, the fairly new product um, with regards to to soil moisture. We're also talking um, to our group, uh, our geomatics group in Ottawa with regards to using the uh, newly launched um, uh, Venus um, satellite mission. It's a French Israeli mission uh, with, uh, with regards to um, high resolution um, crop imagery and also um, soil moisture. Um, and so uh, the, the goal here is to basically account for as many factors as we can, that we think will have an important um, impact on uh, on uh, canola yield in those in those fields, and the reason uh, we're looking at moisture, I'm going to give you a bit of a background why we think it's important um, and other environmental covariates. Uh, this is just a just a snapshot from one of the papers we published um, from my postdoc uh, research. Um, we've analyzed the uh, 18 years of uh, crop and soil data uh, from the, that came from the research farm in, um, at the AFC research farm in, in Scott, Saskatchewan. And, uh, and um, the, we've, uh, we've done some uh, interesting analysis because it's a, it's a, it was a very useful uh, data set with a lot of, uh, with a lot of data. Uh, and uh, we've 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 came to we found very interesting uh, thing that um, in for example in canola uh, across the 18 years of the study uh, it was interesting that the precipitation um, was the most uh, June precipitation um, uh, was the most important factor that drove uh, canola yield in that particular field and it wasn't the fixed. Um, fixed treatment. Uh, in that particular um, case, the fixed treatments were um, different yield in intensities and cropping rotations. Uh, well, um, the, the cropping diversity was the second most important factor, uh, followed by May precipitation and July growing degree days. Um, we've basically included the uh, monthly growing season precipitation and the uh, heat units in the um, uh, in the in the in the partitioning analysis and partial least squares analysis, and it was a, a very interesting finding um, that we've published in that paper, and that's why um, we 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 thought that uh, by um, measuring this real time moisture data will gi will give us even a better um, ability to detect this important signal. Um, should it be determined that uh, this factor is in fact uh, important in uh, driving canola yield in that particular field. 
Um, now, just uh, three more points from my from my past from my past um, postdoctoral research. As I said, uh, water was one of the mo uh, major yield driving factors. Um, the yield was affected by um, fixed um, fixed factors uh, in addition to uh, terrain attributes, the field topography, uh, followed by growing season precipitation, degree days, and cropping diversity. And inclusion of these factors in the analysis allowed us to uh, to uh, pin down that variance that uh, would otherwise be lost unexplained if we had analyzed this um, large data set with only fixed factors in mind. Um, and um, uh, this is uh, this is one of our research fields in Manitoba. Um, and uh, this is uh, I know you you've seen a lot of um, yield maps today uh, and and yesterday, but this one um, gives you a good understanding of. Uh, um, in this particular case, uh, the uh, high, medium, and low uh, producing zones. And uh, this is just a schematic that shows you where, where these um, soil moisture probes were installed, as I said, across, uh, across the soil profile. And as I said, they're giving us uh, um, a lot of data that we can uh, use in, the, in, the, in our uh, big data analysis. Uh, to see what's, um, if it's an important factor that drives crop uh, canola yield. Uh, with regards to terrain attributes, uh, we've calculated uh, for each field uh, 49 attributes uh, with, uh, with the assistance of two products, either Land Mapper or Sega. And these terrain attributes, they are basically, uh, they explain, um, they describe the topography of a given field in terms of um, elevation, uh, slope, aspect, um, and uh, and and things like that. And uh, in in our experience, they also um, they also explain a lot of variation within field, which is of particular interest uh, to producer. So um, to sum it up, uh, in the in our big data research, in big data analysis, we include uh, many factors uh, such as yield, um, spatial inputs, as I said, the, the different inputs of uh, fertilizer application, uh, detailed field management practices, terrain, weather, um, output from ground and remote sensing products. We also try to use uh, various um, information from various uh, machinery into, um, into this analysis to see if the um, if this can um, shed uh, additional light to the questions we're exploring here. And um, another important layer of information is the output from process-based field scale modeling, which I will um, discuss um, in a few um, following slides. So um, the RCAPEX model uh, is, uh, is basically derives from the EPIC, the Environmental Policy Integrated Climate Model, which uh, was um, originally created in back in 1983 as the erosion uh, impact cal calculator, but over the last years, it basically uh, over the past um, uh, decades, it became a very a comprehensive bio, um, biophysical biochemical model that basically this the that basically simulates the um, all the all the processes uh, such as crop growth, um, the, the 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 biogeochemical biophysical processes that occur uh, in the soil profile and at the interaction of uh, soil, um, uh, air, and water spheres. Um, so um, it's a it's a it's a first approach basically to um, simulate the processes that were happening at the at the field scale. And now with our capex gives uh, gives us a, a bit more power in terms of simulate uh, these processes that I mentioned not only on a field scale, but we can also um, we can um, we can we can break down uh, the field in the so-called um, hydrological response units, and uh, those hydrological response units are um, homogeneous units uh, in terms of soil, land use, and topography. Uh, and the model is able to simulate flow from one, one sub-area to another um, through the channels and floodplains to watershed outlet. And the model can simulate sediment, nutrients, 
pesticide transport um, and so on and so forth. Uh, again, this is the, um, the one of the largest advantages of this model is that it allows to simulate spatial inputs, which is really relevant to, to our research program, uh, spatial inputs in terms of fertilizer, soil moisture, uh, management, topography based on individual hydrological response units, groups of them, or the entire field. Um, so this is one of the fields that uh, it shows you a little bit of a model interface. It's basically an uh, uh, ArcGIS uh, toolbar in the ArcGIS um, client, uh, and um, and what what the 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 shapes that you see um, outlined with purple lines, those are the HRUs that I've been talking about. And you can um, the the green dots represent uh, different outlets. Um, so. Um, so this is more um, this is more appealing, I think. We can overlay those um, the, on the right side of the slide. Uh, you can see how we overlay this yield map um, over uh, over the the field. Um, that is um, that you can also see the hydrological response units. So for I hope you can see my cursor. So um, for um, consistently producing low yielding zones here. Um, we can look at the at those individual HRUs in the model output and we can see um, what are the factors, what the possible factors that are responsible for this low yield. Uh, it could be um, excess moisture, it could be salinity, it could be something else. Uh, or it could be uh, like uh, extremely dry temperature because for each HRU, there is an output that we can basically investigate. In this particular case, we would look at probably a group of HRU because uh, this, this low yielding zone here and here, it doesn't necessarily adhere to just one single HRU. But, but you see what I mean here, this gives us a much more flexibility to explore the field it really in, on a on a spatial scale here, not just look at the field like the the just the field itself, but we can also dig deeper into um, different zones in the field and uh, and explore things that are responsible for uh, for low yield or um, for example, we can also check the edge of field nitrogen and phosphorus dynamics. We can look at carbon. We can look at emissions. So this is um this is a really valuable tool um, to utilize in this particular research. Um, <clears throat> so in the in the couple of the in the few minutes that I have left here, I was going to show you the results um, of the model validation of uh, uh, one particular uh, field that we've been working with in Manitoba, um, and I just um, and uh, like. I may be uh, a bit rushing through the, the slides, uh, but um, I guess like for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just trying to show the capability of the model and uh, not that the, the numbers are not important, but um, like you, I, I just want you to see the capacity of what we can do here. Um, and um, because like if I, uh, the, the, the data, uh, the 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 in terms of dynamics of the crop yield and nitrogen and phosphorus that deserves another an hour and thirty minute talk which which I don't have here today, um, but uh, like uh, this is the this is the uh, results from the um, model validation exercise at uh, our field in Manitoba and you can see. On the x-axis, there is the average high and low producing zones, and on the y-axis, it's a uh, crop yield. Um, so you can see that the model is is sensitive to replicate the crop yield in different uh, zones in the field, and that's and the same goes for for uh, for nitrate. And this is the most important, um, I guess, message that I want you to take from this presentation: that this model is capable to um, pick up the dynamics in terms of a different processes uh, relevant to different HRUs in that particular field. Um, like, and I, um, 
I'm not aware, uh, and again, I may be wrong, but I've uh, I try to keep to stay on top of the uh, the papers that are being published in this uh, in this um, area of my expertise, and I've and I haven't seen so far a model that was capable to do something like that on a field scale. Again, maybe I'm I don't know something, you know, but um, to me it sounds like it's a it's a valuable tool to have. Um, to conduct uh, this type of research, so you can see that the um, there is a there is a higher um, there is a higher uh, nitrate content in the high yielding zone, uh, lower uh, in the low, and uh, sort of average in the um, in the in the average zone. And the model was able to pick it up. Uh, now phosphorus is always a bit tricky to um, to to model. You know the, the model is not. Uh, as sensitive as I would like it to be, but that's um, to be expected. And um, like uh, you know, uh, there there is a there is an ongoing work, uh, not only for this model but for other models out there to accurately represent soil phosphorus dynamics uh, on the field and watershed scale. Um, now, I mentioned about climate change being another aspect of this research, and uh, I just want to show you. Um, the results of the what model projected in terms of the future crop yield. Uh, in this particular case, um, you see that the crop is likely to increase. And again, there is a variation between the zone. Uh, there is a difference in the in the future soil um, soil nitrate. Um, uh, there is a, there is less variation in terms of soil P, as I mentioned, which is to be expected. Uh, and uh, we also dig uh, dag a little bit deeper there to see what kind of factors might be responsible for the trends that we have observed in crop and uh, um, nutrient dynamics that I just presented. So we've looked at water erosion, and as you can see, the model can also um, appreciate the difference between the um, soil loss from water erosion between the different zones. Uh, soil loss from wind erosion. Again, I, I'm sorry I'm rushing through the slides, but again, I just want you to see the the trend here that the mo what model is capable of. Um, the the future nitrate uh, nitrate transported through leaching, uh, the um, nitrate lost with sediment, uh, and um, uh, historic and future uh, soil P transported with surface runoff. Uh, and uh, historic and future phosphorus um, uh, transported with uh, with sediment loss. Um, so I know I uh, I have a I have a couple of minutes left. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the team I'm uh, working with here uh, in Brandon um, and uh, the project that provided funded funding for this research. I was asked to ask a few minutes. Um, to allow for um, for like a expanded question uh, and answer session, which I which I think I'm um, I'm I'm still uh, doing quite well to to accommodate that request. Um, these are the some of the publications. Uh, if you want to look at more details behind the graphs and slides that I presented here, and with that, uh, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer the questions. maybe have come from the microphone. When we're in the Q&A session, um, you may be getting feedback through your microphone. I'm not sure. There may be no way that I can prevent that. At any rate, we're going to move on then with our last presentation. It'll be Marissa and myself, and we're going to be taking a quick look at the potential for canola in the brown soil zone in keeping with our, our theme of increasing acre profitability and managing production risk. The brown soils present a unique opportunity. Just need to wait for our, our presentation to load as well. Am I nervous? <laughs> no, you aren't. You can take the time to introduce yourself. How do I work this thing? Uh, I think green arrow means go. Green is go? Okay. Yeah. 
Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marissa robitai Balog. Thank you, Curtis, for introducing me. I work as an agronomy specialist with the Canola Council of Canada, and I'm based out of Lethbridge, Alberta. So I cover the Southwest Prairie region, uh, which is essentially all of Southern Alberta from Calgary down to the Montana border. And I travel into Saskatchewan as well to about the Maple Creek area. So my territory is in a large amount of the brown soil zone. I'm excited to be here today to talk with you all about the brown soil zone, what we've been doing so far and what we hope to accomplish moving forward. I'd like to begin with some background into the brown soil zone and why we feel it is important to be talking about this region when discussing canola production. We set out to look for opportunities of growth in the brown soil zone and we've done this in two ways. We did an analysis of the relative profitability of the crop and we've created and distributed a survey to growers and agronomists in the brown soil zone to find opportunities for canola in the region and to understand the challenges around canola production. Canola production and more resources towards it in the brown soil zone is an opportunity to add a sustainable and a profitable crop into growers' current farming rotations. Our survey results, which I will share in a few moments, showed us that there is a need for and an interest in growing canola. As we've discussed in quite depth yesterday, and Curtis will highlight in the next few slides, there are four new processing plants coming online on the edge of the brown soil zone in the Regina area over the next couple of years. We recognize that there will be an interest from more farmers in the surrounding area in the brown soil zone to consider growing canola to help meet that steady source of demand by local processors over the years ahead. So with that, I'll let Curtis go over the next few slides. Perfect. Thank you. Make sure I have this going forward. So all of you can recognize our canola production area, uh, areas in Canada, the blacks, the dark browns, and the browns. All of you will recognize that the uh, brown soil zone fits very nicely in what is called the Palliser's Triangle. Any of you who took Canadian studies in grade four, grade seven, and grade 10 will rec remember, I think I have this right, that Captain John Palliser was uh, a member of the British Army. He was an Irish aristocrat, and his job was to map out uh, the border along the, the, the border along the United States from Red River Valley into the Rocky Mountains. And when he got to Palliser's Triangle, which was aptly named after him, actually it was his botanist who was really cool guy too, his name was John McCoon, if you want to look up botanists in Western Canada. But anyways, Palliser, and, and actually it's probably his botanist, who said, the area is not fit for man nor beast, okay? So that was a direct quote. It was settled anyways uh, and farmed because of the need for security along Canada-US border. We had to have people along our border, and so our Canadian government was actively involved um, moving settlers into the area. But farming, as you all know, has proved difficult and challenging because of periodic, sporadic, and non-predictive non rainfall. So they do have rainfall events, but often much in, much in deficit of what is required to actually uh, grow crops, and that's where innovation and technology have come in. Zero till, conservation till, plant breeding, etc., has made the area, actually, the brown soils, zones very productive, and probably uh, uh, if Palliser was alive, he'd be eating his words. To keep on going, um, as Marissa said, and I think was talked about by Jim and others yesterday, um, there's expanded interest in, in, the canola, in the brown soil zones for canola production just because of a recent announcement of, of uh, crush capacity expansion in the, in the areas south of Regina and in Yorkton as well. And so with online capacity or expansion capacity, which is very substantive, um, our historical uh, analysis has shown that when, when plants have been established or been expanded, et cetera, crop production and acreage tends to follow. And so if that's going to be the case, then what can we do to make canola growers as successful as possible in the brown soil zones? My colleagues uh, at our crop production innovation team, um, the entire team as well, I'd like to single out Chris Mancher as well, did a bunch of modeling around uh, and data gathering, data exercise, just to look at what historically uh, canola has looked like on, in the brown soil zones. And it, this data is coming from, the, from the, uh, our, our Canadian census data. Those regions uh, superimposed on the soil zones itself are the census ag, uh, ag districts. And so if you look at the black soil zones and you look at 40, the, the number is the percentage, percentage 
percent acres of seeded canola compared to canola seeded acres on a five-year average. So if you look at the black, black soil zones, anything above 40 percent would typically, you'd think, is about a one and two rotation. Brown soil zones, we moved to sort of 34, 33, 30 percent. That would be indicative of a one and three rotation. And then you get into the, sorry, that's the dark brown soils. And then when you get into the brown soil zones, you see numbers as low as 7 percent, 16 percent, 13 percent. And then, of course, we have some higher numbers, 24, 25, et cetera. And there you have the census ag region tends to have a draw of both dark brown and brown. And so you get some artifact from the, probably from the dark brown rotation. But at any rate, um, historically, in the last 10 years then, um, uh, the trend has been fairly similar. Uh, canola on a rotation would be sort of one in six years as, an, as a good working average. If you look at his, uh, yields from 2011, uh, the prairie average yield is the blue line, and brown soil zones, uh, as, you would, as you would appreciate, because of, of moisture, moisture or, or precipitation amounts and timing, tends to ha be, be lower, but you can see in some years where the brown soil zones did have moisture, in particular 2016, it, there's a potential for quite high yields in, in, in the region. So when you get rain, and we all know that, when you get rainfall and it's timely rainfall, the yields follow. But there is, there is, some, there is upper, um, there is upper uh, yield potential for the genetic varieties that we do have. And of course, then our trick will be to think about managing moisture and fertility that goes along with moisture. And last, or I have two more slides here, but the, the big thing that's driving, that does tend to drive um, adoption in acres, of course, is profitability. This data comes from the Saskatchewan government. You can find it on the website. And we looked at, at, at break-even yields um, and Saskatchewan yield averages um, in both the black and, 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 the, and the brown soil zones. And you can see, if you look at the brown soil zone lentils, the black, the black, the black bar is the break-even yield covering total expenses for 2022. And then the, the yellow bar is the average yield, and the standard error bar then would be actually the minimum and the maximum yield from 2011-2020. You can see in the browns, if you're looking at lentils, for instance, even the minimum yield has always, um, always returns a positive ROI or always covers your break-even costs. Uh, canola, not always the case, and wheat, of course, not always the case. We also, we did pull spring wheat and durum uh, wheat apart. The numbers are slightly different. I'm not presenting the data here. And then lastly, um, we looked at the, the commodity prices as well and just looked at the, the and again, there's a number of different ways you can split out this data, but we took a look at the 2022 break-even prices and then just did a, a snapshot in time over the last couple of years just to look at commodity price versus that break-even price. And you can see that lentils and canola, uh, especially lentils, are, uh, they're, uh, they have quite a bit of, uh, they give you qu quite a bit of profitability over the break-even price. What was a little interesting is how close wheat tends to follow at times that, that break-even price. But it shows you that there's opportunity for canola. There's, 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 we all know the opportunities for pulses, and we can start thinking about how we fit uh, in that rotation. That's, uh, we have a lot more data than that. If anybody wants to talk data or wants to see the data, we're happy to share it with you. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Marissa. Thanks, Curtis. All right, so diving into the survey a little bit further, the crop production and innovation team surveyed producers and agronomists who work and farm in the brown soil zone in the summer of 2022, and a total of 19 growers and agronomists were interviewed in detail. The survey helped us to understand what the educational gaps are that we face in the brown soil zone, where do we have opportunities to improve canola production practices, what are the economics of canola production in the brown soil zone, and also, how does the risk of growing canola compare to other commonly grown crops in rotation, including durum and lentils? So before diving into some of this, okay, for, before diving into some of the okay. specific survey questions and answers, I want to review our overall findings from the survey. The survey showed us that one, there is a need for more canola research in the brown soil zone, as little is being conducted currently at both private and public levels. The opportunity to have research done in the brown soil zone, despite the fact that it is a typically drier area, would reflect on typical growing conditions that producers face. Two, 
that canola is equally as profitable as other commonly grown crops in rotation, including durum and lentils, but there is more assumed risk and upfront cost associated with growing canola versus other crops. And three, that there are educational gaps and challenges that need to be addressed in the area, focusing primarily on nutrient management and plant establishment. I'd like to go through some of Oh, are we okay? <laughs> I'd like to go through some of our questions um, in more detail. For the sake of time, I won't be going through all of them today. If you are interested in reading our entire survey summary document, please let me know and we can provide that to you. So the first survey question asks, what are the top three drawbacks to growing canola in the brown soil zone? The number one answer we received was that the crop input pricing is too high when you think about it in terms of the cost of seed, fertilizer, crop inputs, including herbicide, insecticide, and fungicides. Secondly, because moisture can be so variable in the brown soil zone, the risk of growing canola was perceived as much higher than other crops. And thirdly, growers and agronomists felt that canola required more time and resources to manage versus some other options in rotation. When we asked growers and agronomists what they felt the educational hurdles or challenges that they faced in the brown soil zones may be, we received a large variety of answers. Some of the challenges brought up the most frequently included fertilizer placement and how to, fertilize, how to make fertilizer decisions in continuously dry years. How deep should you be planting your canola, particularly following a drought? And how to be consistently checking your seed depth? Other educational concerns that came up included how to manage flea beetles, particularly following some of the challenges that we faced in 2021 and 2022, as well as identifying verticillium stripe um, and not misdiagnosing it as black leg, and how to utilize farming equipment to follow current best management practices. Because canola is so new to the brown soil zone in general, fertility and plant establishment are the biggest hurdles that we face. The questions on this slide focused on understanding how contribution margins affect the decision to grow canola. Growers and agronomists surveyed felt that margins are competitive and canola was equal to lentils but may not be perceived that way every year due to the high input cost. Secondly, a result from the second question, does canola need to be equal to other crops or can it be less? The answer showed us that canola could be slightly below contribution margins of lentils and durum but the value could be shown on farm in operations that were looking to diversify their crop rotations for weed and disease control as well. And the last survey questions that I wanted to share today were around the perceived risks of growing canola. The first question in the slide asks, how does the risk of growing canola compare to other crops in your rotation? Canola was perceived as higher risk for a few reasons, including environmental pressures such as dry conditions that the brown soil zone often faces and the inability to predict the growing season. Pest pressures, including insects and less frequently talked about disease were also part of that decision. Pulses were viewed as a high risk cropping option as well, according to our survey responses due to increased disease pressures such as aphanomyces, herbicide options that could potentially limit what next year's crops may be, and decreased crop competitiveness in high weed pressure situations. Durham was viewed as a generally less risky cropping option. The final survey question asked growers and agronomists if canola was a crop that they were willing to spend the money on if they've made the decision to grow it. The answer was unanimously yes. Growers are most likely to invest into their canola crops versus other crops on farm, according to our survey. This shows us that while there is a larger cost associated with growing canola and it can be inherently riskier, the value and the ROI in a good growing season was enough for growers to put the investment into the crop. So what are the next steps for the brown soil zone? Currently, the crop production team at Council is working together to create a list of research priorities for the brown soil zones for 2023. Earlier last month, we went through an exercise of ranking where the agronomy specialists felt the most research needed to be done in the brown soils. Coming in first was plant establishment, followed by nutrient management, and thirdly, equipment and harvest timing. These answers align very closely with what the survey showed us as well, so we know that these are good places to start when we're considering research projects. We're currently in the process of designing research protocols and we are trying to secure funding for this and currently looking into opportunities to fund a project that will aim at answering these questions. If you are interested in collaborating with us, please let us know. A project that focuses on answering some of these questions is an opportunity in a beginning to increase research capacity in the brown soil zone, specifically in canola production. We know that little research is currently taking place 
and we'd like to work with life science companies, grain handling companies, and grower group associations closely to encourage more private industry research in the brown soils with the idea, um, with the idea that interest and resources for continued research will increase in the brown soils from 2024 on. In terms of extension, we are going to be increasing our extension presence in the brown soil zones as well. Our work plans as agronomists from 2023 for forward will reflect this. If we can get research situated, that would include hosting crop tours and being able to have demonstrations and discussions directly in the brown soil zone. Oops, I'm a little quick on my clicker. <laughs> in conclusion, there are hurdles to overcome in the brown soil zone, but it should be viewed as a unique opportunity. It's unique in the sense that the climate is often dry, often windy, and I do say that as someone who lives in Lethbridge myself, and it can be perceived as challenging. But it's also unique in the sense that canola is a relatively new crop to the region. Getting back to that core basic agronomy is an opportunity to get the industry thinking about canola in the brown soil zone, adapting best management practices, creating research opportunities tailored to the unique conditions, and developing resources for producers in the brown soil zone allows the opportunity to increase yields to meet demand and drive the canola industry. Here is an opportunity for us to be supporting growers in the area who are considering growing canola. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marissa. With that, we're going to open the floor up to questions and as well, um, online questions as well. And I think, Marissa, you're going to be fielding the online questions, is that correct? And I'll be trying to field questions from the floor. So, questions. And Justin, if you come to the front, yep. Terrace, I hope you're, uh, I hope you're available. Uh, I'll be reading the questions out to you because you won't be able to, if there's a question directed to you, you won't be able to see it. So, I'll read the question. Steve. Yeah, I, I was interested in uh, the, uh, it's, about, it's about the brown soil zone and canola and that. I didn't hear any mention of mustard in, the, in your, in your uh, presentation there, and that's typically been viewed as the oil seed for the brown soil zone. Is, is, there any, is there any thought that canola may become mean more competitive to mustard as time goes on, and how, and how does that factor into your analysis? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the, there, there is still um, there is still interest in in brassica in canola quality brassica juncea, okay, and there there are uh, there are breeding programs in place, and uh, and um, germplasm developers, so the bra the brown soil uh, zone is it would be a, a, a prime prime production area for brass for canola quality brassica juncea as well. I think the 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 key thing is going to be looking at relative profitability, and the, uh, it's a testament to our, our you know, the, the germ, both our pu public and private breeders in that um, uh, canola yields have still, you know, far surpassed mustard yields in the brown soil zones in the last decade, for instance. And so, I, I think Juncea has a lot of possibility as well. But again, you know, will breeding and agronomy keep up with what we can do in Napus? So, to be determined. Thanks. Jason. A uh, uh, question for Evan on the uh, uh, farm management styles and, uh, and some of the things that we see as far as HR and, and working with, uh, with employees. And I was just curious, I know um, like the Hutterite colonies do represent a large uh, percentage of, of land that they manage as well as farm. And, uh, and definitely the workforce. Could you kind of make mention or comment to any of the uh, strategies that, uh, that they might be using or something that you have any, any impact from, uh, from the colonies? Well, I, I think, in, and not necessarily just the colonies, but the, the larger scale model for the farm enterprise has taken over other industries. So it's, it's not something revolutionary, it's just revolutionary to agriculture. So what I mean by that is, other industries for years and years have had compensation matrices and, and levels of hierarchy and essentially roles and responsibilities, where on the family farm it was, it was never needed. So now that we've seen the, the consolidation of land and, and I mean farms growing from that 
two to three thousand dollar or two to three thousand acre mom and pop operation to a five to ten thousand where we need to start bringing in HR, they've never had to deal with the philosophies like like the colonies have and like some of the bigger agriculture producers have where you need to actually have assigned roles, you need to have assigned hierarchy of managers and who's in charge of what and it needs to, and I mean maybe outside the colony side, but it needs to have a compensation matrix more close to industry. We're, we're really good at hiring a $20 employee and putting them on a $2 million drill, whereas other industries would never do that. If we're in a construction industry, you're not going to put your cheapest labor on your most expensive piece of equipment, but in agriculture, we actually, that, that's our goal, is we'll go to the mine and we'll find, we'll find a guy who works part-time or we'll find a retired farmer and we'll say, here, we want you to do the most important thing on our farm, which is put the seed in the ground where that model has to change as you grow. And I think the, the colonies have done that through education and through just having the, the, the HR standards. And so have the large scale farms. It's just, we need to bring the rest of agriculture up because it's to that point where the 3000 acre farms, and it, it's not good to say, but we're seeing the consolidation quickly and it's happening much faster even this year than it did the year before and the year before. And they're, they're growing faster than they've actually built an HR platform to actually handle it. So when I see that slide of the Manitoba, that, that's my biggest risk is that we're going to grow so fast and all of a sudden realize that we don't have the people to actually do it. Any other questions from the floor? Any other qu any questions online? There are no questions online yet. Well, I'll keep it open online for a couple of more, 30 more seconds and then if there are no more questions, I'll wrap up the day. Oh, sorry, there is one. Okay. Um, this one would be for Evan. Has a JDHZ type hoe drill ever been looked at to seed canola in the brown soils? Sorry, this is for Curtis. Okay. This drill is used to seed in Palouse country where seed is placed in a deep furrow to reach moisture but seeded slowly. Hmm. <laughs> I'm going to turn that, I'm, gonna, I'm looking to my own colleagues here, Crop Production Innovation. Any of you had any experience, any of our growers in the... Great question. I don't know the answer to that one. I will try to find the answer to that question. I, I can add a little bit to that. So You can? So okay. I, I don't have the answer for the hoe drill, I apologize. But I do have, so we've, uh, we've tested in the past essentially a corn planter that they, they brought up to us. It was a Kinsey that John Deere was trying to trying to turn into the next canola planter. And from a standard of mortality rates and a standard of bushel per acre, it, it, it does show to have higher than the actual drill mechanism and toolkit. But what we found was they've been created for southern crops, which means they don't have rocks in the US. So when you bring them into Canadian soils where we actually have a few boulders here and there, the, just the, the repairs and the, the upkeep ends up being more detrimental in the downtime than it does to actually comparing. So even though we had a 60 foot corn planter that could essentially do the job of a 60 foot drill, the downtime ended up being more than what we needed. Thanks for the comment. I, 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 I mean, I think hoe drills probably have some potential if you can seed shallowly and you can me meter the seed accurately. Uh, why not? But, uh, but specifically to that particular piece of uh, equipment. I'll have to get back to you. Well, and I, and I think it ties back to the moisture comment he made is that, and I think Rob Stone touched on it, is if you have moisture in the brown soil zone, those roots will find it. So we've had, I mean, we've had wheat roots nicking at a four foot moisture probe in the ground. So if you can get the plant started, it will have the ability to find moisture. Mm -hmm. So which is a benefit for the brown soil. It's just, I think that shallow depth and if you don't get rain, that's where you end up paying for it in the brown. Yeah, and the the whole rooting question may be one of the key, one of the the keys to look at one of the key differences between Juncia and Napus as well, right? We we may find that there are some interesting um, differences in terms of uh, gene expression for rooting depth, depth, etc. So, again, more on that front as well. There oh. is another online question. Okay. How much canola acreage is handled by custom operators? We see this in increasing where we live in the USA for corn and soybeans. <laughs> now you're outside my realm of experience. Um, I, I don't know. Anybody in the audience? There's 
any of our other panelists this morning? Anybody have any idea on, on uh, numbers of custom or acres of custom app? Again, I'll get back. I don't know the answer to that. My apologies. I, I, I think it would be fair to say it's growing. Yeah. Right? So. Well, and even I was, like I said, I was down in Montana last week and a lot of the conference, this was the first one that the grain growers had included, the canola and pulse grower side of it. And they're starting to see the potential in canola going down into the U.S. now as well. So, I mean, there is potential of, of pulling it down there and, and getting increased acreage because I think it, it's an attractive crop right now. Yeah, what, what, if it work, what will work in Montana will work in, in the Browns in, the Browns in Canada okay. and what yeah. works in the Browns in, Manicato or in, in Saskatchewan translates to Montana and other areas as well. So. Well, I think with that, I'm going to just try to wrap up the day. Um, first of all, um, uh, yeah, we had a couple of good sessions. I've always, uh, I always actually enjoy doing this, but I'm, I'm not always on my A game here, but hopefully I can, I can bring it here. So our first session was, uh, was around precision agricultural technology, entitled Precision Agricultural Technology Today. And there were a number of things that jumped out uh, at me and our, our group. They tended to be sort of one-liners. It's not rocket science. Uh, it's even more complicated. Um, set your expectations up front and try to keep it as simple as possible. Simplicity is the key. Um, data portability, um, issues of data or discussion around data portability and open access as well as data privacy and data ownership also were uh, germane to the discussion and, uh, and, and sort of we closed off with that. And then one of the things that I started thinking about as I was listening to uh, the discussion as well is we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of expertise and algorithms uh, working on field scripts uh, around canola and all of our other crops that we're growing. And I started thinking about, okay, where, where is the data that's coming from in terms of the nitrogen response curves that will be driving the field scripts uh, for, for um, nitrogen management? And um, where does that data set come from? Because if I look at our published literature in Western Canada, if it's published literature coming from the public domain, those are pretty old studies, like they're going back 30 years in terms of our nitrogen response curves for some of our varieties. I contrast that with the, uh, with the corn hybrids in the United States and the extensive support from the land grant extension uh, agencies there, and you typically have a lot of nitrogen response curves published with all of the hybrids that are released. And so we don't have that level of, of, of granularity with, uh, with respect to our, our, some of our germplasm necessarily. I think we have good ideas, but we probably have, uh, if being, this being a discovery form, we probably have some opening here in terms of um, doing some more research in terms of nitrogen response curves, some of our hybrids, especially in the different moisture growing areas. So that was, uh, that, those were some of my takeaways. Um, if you indulge me for a couple of seconds, too, we had a discussion from the John Deere, um, John Deere representative on acquisition about plants that grow, glow, pardon me, not plants that grow, pa plants that grow, uh, glow. Um, this was done, I think, if I remember correctly, and maybe Larry Cernick will keep me honest, he, honest here as well. This was done, I think, about 33 years ago, or 35 years ago, um, when I was moving from Guelph to Monsanto, there was a small startup company in coming out of University of California, Davis, okay? A bunch of research scientists. We were all on a mission at back then to remove selectable markers, to take out antibiotic resistance genes as selectable markers. That was EFSA, USDA, EPA, et cetera. So they came up with a selectable marker using uh, the luciferin gene, which is the gene that lights up the firefly, okay? And a group of the the UCAL Davis researchers there transformed poinsettia and then when they would, with the luciferin gene, and when they would feed luciferase in the substrate along with the nutrients to the poinsettia, the poinsettia would light up perfectly. It would express the luciferin, the luciferin gene in the poinsettia. Of course, they took it off the market very quickly because of all of the, the issues around regulatory, et cetera, et cetera, with GMO. But it has been done. Plants that glow have been produced, just so you know. Okay, seeing it's a discovery form, I had to throw that in. The second session, improving every canola acre session, 
there again, we had, some, we had three good presentations. The, the take home for me uh, for, from some of these presentations, Dr. Mark McConnell, and I think it was again a theme that echoed out through the day, let ROI decide what you manage and how to manage it differently or, or change your production or management practices. Let ROI be the, be the direct, uh, direct your activities. And then also the statement around those unprofitable acres may be more unprofitable than you think. Uh, Marla uh, really got us out of the box with the idea of, I've, it's never dawned on me, take the soil from the bottom of the slope and move it back up to the top of the slope. Who's ever, that's, I've never thought of that. It's a brilliant idea in terms of restoring organic matter, et cetera. So that might be the most out of the box uh, thing that we've ever had at a, a discovery forum. And, um, and also, I appreciate all of the, the tie into the physical properties, compaction, et cetera. We so easily forget all of the things that drive soil and root growth and fertility uptake and, of course, profitability. And um, I had another quote here. Oh, from, from Marla, which really resonated. We've added variability by not talking or thinking about variability. Thanks for that quote. That should be a, a highlight for the day, too. And the last, last but not least, we had David Wetter talking about, um, uh, about uh, tile drainage and really uh, talking about what a difference maker tile drainage can be. We've, all, we've seen evidence of that, but that there are situations where it may or may not be so helpful and that there's also watchouts, and it's not the tool for every acre in Western Canada. And then last, uh, where, where the, the farmer panel was really interesting as well. Um, that, that's uh, one of the quotes that came out uh, was make better data or make better data and numbers both for our farmers, for politicians and for the public and that was in this discussion around carbon and nitrogen as well as, as, uh, as other, other tools that were other data that we're capturing in terms of utilizing data for making farm management um, decisions. And then uh, continuous learning um, is, is key to success for the, this group of growers, and I think that came out in, in spades. Evan touched on this as well in his presentation, that continuous learning model. It's okay to ask questions. You need to start somewhere, so start. And then I think the other thing that I learned is it's maybe okay to hire somebody if you don't have all the answers yourself. And that, I think, is it for my wrap-up. So before we conclude today, um, just wanted to again thank all of the speakers, uh, all of the speakers, both in the last panel and, uh, and throughout the day. So we can have a final closing round of applause for all the speakers. I appreciate that. As with our, our other sessions and other days, in lieu of speaker gifts, we've again, uh, we're making a, a donation to the Keith Downey Undergraduate Scholarship at the University of Saskatchewan. And so thanks, Keith, again, and, and donations made on behalf of our speakers. Um, again, um, a, couple of housekeeping, um, a couple of housekeeping things here. We also ask you to fill out our Canola Discovery Forum um, survey. We have a brief survey. Uh, reminder to collect CCA credits um, if you haven't done that already. Uh, recordings of our presentations are going to be available uh, in our virtual platform for early next week. There's probably a bunch of thing, nuggets you want to go re-listen to again, just to clarify. And if you do have other questions or comments around any of those pre uh, presentations, uh, feel free to contact the speaker or contact us as well, and we can and forward them. Um, we're going to get started early tomorrow with our Canola Innovation Day. So 8 a.m. with breakfast, um, opening remarks 9 o'clock sharp, I believe. Be safe, be warm till then. And then just last but not least, again, a final thanks, uh, a word of thanks to all of our sponsors who made this day and also this whole week happen. I'd like to thank, Bo uh, first of all, our member, our grower organization, SAS Canola, Alberta Canola, and Manitoba Canola Growers Association, as well as the Canadian Canola Growers Association. Our member companies, which are BASF, Bayer, Corteva, and Nutrien. And then the, uh, the gracious support of Decisive Farming by TELUS Agriculture, John Deere, um, New Seed, Nutrien, SAS, uh, sorry, Syngenta, Western Green Research Foundation, and Winfield United. So have a good evening. Thanks a lot, everybody, today. See you.